How are you surviving the COVID-19 pandemic? All the distancing and the isolation. Pizza? Wine? Netflix? Well, some of us, but many, if not most of us, independent of location, nationality, and religion or lifestyle, seek refuge and respite in something else, nature. While the streets, shops, and offices are deserted, every time I go out to my local beachside park, it's brimming with people, distancing, but walking, exercising, taking in the fresh air and the beauty of the open green space. It feels good. And my Facebook feed is literally taken over by photographic reports of avid nature goers hidden inside of my friends I never knew existed before. It is a collective, visual and verbal, ode and a love song to nature. Being allowed out in the nature is seen as a key fundamental right, even in places with rather strict distancing and isolation measures. It is readily perceived by those making key decisions as crucial to keep populations healthy and sane during an extraordinarily stressful and challenging time. Because while we might be able to substitute human contact with an online version to some extent, however limited, there is no satisfactory replacement for the connection with nature. Filling our lungs with fresh, oxygen-rich air, immersing in the beauty of lush flowering green, hearing the relaxing bird songs and bees, the calming rustle of leaves in the wind. You will likely agree that watching nature documentaries on Netflix just does not cut it. And so, while we are apart, the importance of nature to us humans has become so very evident and undeniable. We might have lost the full awareness of it over decades of busy and increasingly urbanized lifestyles spent largely indoors and on busy city streets. Still, nature is inexhaustingly and incessantly providing us with essential ecosystem services. And nowhere else are they as crucial as in our cities. Cities are marvelous places, hustling and bustling with knowledge and innovation, economic and cultural activity, progress. But our urban developments have increasingly pushed out the green, replacing it with concrete, asphalt, sealed surfaces leaving less and less space for natural ecosystems and us as part of those ecosystems to flourish and thrive. In recent years, we are slowly waking up to the fact that nature provides up to more than 50 documented benefits to our cities, providing us with clean air and water, temperature and wind regulation, flood and drought management, capturing pollution, including climate change causing greenhouse gas emissions, enhancing our physical and mental health, as well as providing us with spaces for recreation, active lifestyle, and social connection. Along with this rising awareness, urban citizens are increasingly demanding more trees to be planted, urban gardening plots to be established, public access to waterways and coasts to be safeguarded, demanding more of accessible, well-maintained, and biodiverse urban green. Research consistently shows that we are ready to pay considerably more just to live in a greener neighborhood or closer to a patch of nature in a city. Inclusive access to urban green spaces is also enshrined in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Our urban policymakers and planners are not deaf to this. They are hearing these calls and many have the best intentions to respond and make our cities greener. But often, they get stopped in their tracks. Because the business as usual in urban planning and infrastructure development is geared towards engineered, man-made technological solutions, so-called gray infrastructure. And while it undeniably has an important role, it has delivered results. Alas, this has locked us in a path where all systems are made to cater to these gray solutions alone and nature-based alternatives are not even being considered. 
despite an increasing body of evidence showing that natural ecosystem-based solutions to many urban problems alone or in combination with traditional measures can accomplish the same goals while providing much more of additional benefits. More often than not, nature-based solutions, urban green infrastructure, deliver a higher value for money than our traditional human-made constructions alone. So why is it then so hard to add more green to our urban fabric? Some would say we simply do not have the space for it in our cities, and rightly so. We do need space for all the buildings and streets and the industrial areas and shopping malls and parking. But that is not as big of a problem as we often think. Yes, large urban parks or forests requiring large spaces may offer some benefits that smaller green areas cannot. But there is immense value in so-called novel ecosystems, which are integrated within our built infrastructure, for example, as green roofs or green walls. Also, smaller scale dispersed urban green, a single tree in each backyard, a flowery lawn in an alleyway, rows of potted plants on terraces or balconies, small squares, pocket parks, and micro forests, they all provide considerable and measurable benefits. There is space for nature in our cities. I argue that a much bigger issue than the lack of space is the lack of knowledge. In fact, if we had the missing knowledge on the value of urban nature, we would likely reconsider and change our priorities on how the urban space is allocated and used. We humans as species are a part of nature and have always existed in greater or lesser embeddedness with the natural ecosystems. Still, despite that, we have surprisingly little knowledge on the full value of the benefits nature is providing to us and our cities. Some of us might even have an innate aversion to the idea of putting a number on nature, feeling that it is and should be considered invaluable. But the engineering departments of our city administrations, private property developers, the finance departments, those who are making important decisions and assigning budgets, all of them primarily operate with numbers. With numbers that are readily available for engineered solutions, but are largely missing for nature-based options. A friend of mine who works in the local government of a picturesque town on the coast of Portugal was faced with exactly this problem. The town was increasingly being threatened by flash floods from a stream that runs through it. The proposed solution initially was to construct a series of dams upstream of the river. But my friend's team in the municipality thought that a nature-based solution, restoration of the riverbed, and an establishment of a managed riverside park as flood retention area would protect the town from the floods just as well. But importantly, it would also provide a new recreational green space for the citizens with all its benefits. Furthermore, it could also support the local tourism as they envisioned new nature trail and a bike path through the park. It seemed to be a clear win-win-win. Yet, the finance department was not convinced. While the cost of building a dam and its one purpose benefit were easy to calculate and estimate, my friend's team could not provide the same detail of a quantitative valuation of the varied and diverse range of benefits of the Riverbank Park. In the end, they found a way around the issue, and the park opened in year 2017 to the delight of the locals and guests. And the town of Cascais became one of the world's top 100 sustainable tourist destinations. It's wonderful there, do go visit. But even more, last month, the new Riverbank Park saved the town from an encroaching forest fire, an unplanned benefit. But it all came to be through challenge, overcoming skepticism, and my friend being stubbornly persistent. In retrospect, he confided in me how much easier it would have been if they would have had the same easy way to estimate the value of all the benefits the park delivers in economic terms. 
if they had had the numbers their financing department wanted to hear. Without putting a number on nature, we simply cannot have a fair and evidence-based comparison between the different urban solutions, grey, green or other, on an equal basis. Without valuation, we cannot build a successful business case for that Riverside Park or Green Roof Program or Planting a Million Trees Plan and attract funding and financing that would drive the green urban expansion for the benefit of us all. Us, scientists, have an important role to play here. Our task is to step in and help the urban decision makers to make robust, evidence-based decisions that have the greatest societal benefit. I am working in close collaboration with urban policy and decision makers to develop the tools and knowledge that would enable them to make the urban green expansion happen. And to make our cities not only visibly greener, but also healthier, safer, more sustainable, and more livable places for us all. Because what will get us through now and in the future is nature. <laughs>